We are live. Welcome to Review and Thoughts on 2006 The Fountain. So, this is my first video since we entered the new year, where I actually thought of commenting on the fact that we reached the new year. So, yeah, um, one of my New Year's resolutions was... I am going to stop waiting so long between researching a movie on Disney Plus and actually watching it and doing a video on it that it ends up leaving Disney Plus. So, yeah, here we are. I wasn't originally going to do this this soon. I just wanted to make sure to do it before The Whale. And, uh, oh, right, right. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I know some people have watched The Whale. I'm not entirely sure how far behind but uh currently let's see i i'm not sure how many people have watched it or how long ago but currently it looks like i will be watching it around yeah the the start of march so yeah getting this one out early i hope everyone's 2023 is as great as rudy's 2024 Apparently, they're going to make a new trilogy of Strangers films. That sounds great to me. I'm very happy with the new Halloween trilogy. Not everything about them is amazing, but they're at least going places, exploring ideas that I haven't seen Halloween movies do before. You know, so I looked up the new trilogy on Wikipedia. Turns out there's a music video with the Strangers. It's called With or Without You, all one word, by Partial. So I watched it, and it's fine, but it didn't completely feel like The Strangers to me. Like, I thought I was going to get The Strangers, and instead I'm like... I don't even know these people. So, yeah, here we go. Um, I'm going to start this video by telling you this was a movie that I really found to be average. And yes, I did understand it and appreciate the talent on display. And this video will have, yeah, there's going to be a lot of jokes in the first thoughts section. I uh, Actually, that one might be all MST3K. And I will get into some serious topics. If you're looking for a review that talks about, uh, you know, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up. It's been outdone by later movies because of that. It's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I will be going into the politics, though. And this is definitely one of those movies where you should probably watch it without knowing anything. But, you know, I'm going to keep spoilers to a minimum I'm probably not going to spoil anything at all in the in the review itself. So, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And yes, the review itself should be completely spoiler-free. If I decide to spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So... Content warning and or trigger warning this movie features and I'm going to be discussing cancer, death, grief, genocide, um, colonialism. Now, uh, let's see, so that brings us to, yeah, so the movie is rated PG-13 and so is this video. And if you love this movie, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I just, we happen to disagree. That's all. And I'm going to try to make my case for why I don't love this movie over the course of this video. Definitely, if you do love the movie, you might not enjoy the first thought section. Like, like I said, it's mostly going to be MST3K and... This is one of those videos where I gotta make sure to say, just because I'm MST3King does not mean I don't think that what I'm watching is, like, I still appreciate the talent that went into making it, but I just, this is very MST3Kable, so, yeah. Or riffable, if you wanna go that way. So, that, let's see. Right, so I I think this is my fourth viewing of the movie. I watched it in the year 
2011 was my first viewing, and then I watched it again maybe five years ago by now? Maybe less than five, but yeah. And... Wait, I guess that makes this the third view. Right. Yes. I believe this is my third viewing. And... Let's see... And I will say, like, you know, when I... I feel like each viewing, I slingshot to the other end of the spectrum, you know, uh, of, of how good I think it is, or if I particularly enjoy watching it. Like, I, I enjoyed watching it this time, for sure. Uh, right, I want, I forgot to note that. I'll really quickly write, because technically that does have spoilers, so... Really, really quickly, uh, let's see, it is that the, yes, um, and that is almost it. Okay, so, that brings us to the plot. And I think, yeah, the IMDb one is, is quite, yes, so, as a modern-day scientist, Tommy is struggling with mortality, desperately searching for the medical breakthrough that will save the life of his cancer-stricken wife, Izzy. Now, I've heard so that some women love this romantic aspect that Tom can't bear Izzy dying because he loves her so much he can't live without her. That's great. I don't want to take that away from anyone who really appreciated that. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. The, um, yeah. So, the IMDb more like this list compares this to other Aronofsky films, but also Mr. Nobody, I Origins, Welcome to Earth, k -Pax, and Cloud Atlas. And on Disney Plus, this the, the suggested section contain, uh, has another Earth at Astra, Noah 2014, Joe you know, Aronofsky, Sunshine 2006, uh, Sunshine, does that? I think that's the, because um, there's more than one movie called Sunshine. Um, I believe it is the, yes, it is the, um, Dan, yeah. Can't believe I'm blanking on his name right now. It is the Danny Boyle movie. Uh, Never Let Me Go from 2010. The Longest Ride, My Cousin Rachel, and Water for Elephants. And, yeah. Um, so I already mentioned that I wanted to get this done before The Whale comes out. I've been meaning to do a video on this for years, but for a while I felt like, do I really understand enough? So I did my research. I, I feel like I really understand it. I, um, and, and certainly it's not, you know, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to say something negative because I think something in this is confusing and I'm like personally offended that I didn't get it. Now, um, I, I, yeah, I guess I could say apparently some... Some critics think that this is about time travel, and some, you know, YouTubers despise that theory, which is also, like, I don't even, I don't really understand how you watch this and come away thinking, oh, time travel movie. Uh, I don't think it's about time travel. I don't really see very much evidence supporting that theory. So, yeah, in case you're one of the people who absolutely hate that. Anyway... Um, this was the only, you know, yeah, now that I'm doing a video on this, I have done a video on every single theatrical full-length uh, Darren Aronofsky movie. Um, let's see, and, and yeah, you know, the reason that I held out on this was that I, for a while, I didn't feel like I understood it, and yeah, having done my research this time, I apparently didn't understand it, like, there were things that I understood from earlier viewings, but definitely not all of them. And let's see, that 
brings us to the writing. So this was written, the, uh, yeah, so the screenplay was written by Darren Aronofsky himself, and the story is by Darren Aronofsky and, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Ari Handel. And, yeah, so the, the shorts that um, Aronofsky is responsible for, and apparently, I don't know if I'm going to... Okay, so he's apparently the creator of the Limitless TV show that from you know, started last year with Chris Hemsworth. I don't know if I'm going to... Yeah, that just doesn't really seem like my kind of thing. But, you know, if it's something he wants to do, I'm glad he's doing it. Um, but, but yeah, I've watched all of the theatrical movies that he has directed. I have not watched Below, which he wrote or helped write, and I am probably gonna mispronounce, uh, I don't know if it says how to pronounce it, but I quite like some of the work of, it does not, oh, wait, maybe, maybe, oh, hey, there we go, yeah. David Tui, yes. Uh, I think that, oh man, he could have, Fox wanted him to write and direct a Alien vs. Predator 1, and it was only scheduling conflicts, like, he was, he was interested, and there's apparently a petition that drafts him as writer and director for Alien vs. Predator 3, and he's a fan favorite to help, yeah, yeah, like, he could totally do, and he wrote a script for Alien 3, but it was rejected, Considering the actual script for Alien 3, um, yeah, wow, but, but yeah, um, you know, he wrote The Fugitive, he is, um, behind the, uh, yeah, the, the Pitch Black Riddick movies, I haven't watched any of them, I might at some point, because I do, I really, let, let's see, yeah, yeah, A Perfect Getaway, like, there's something about that movie that I'm like, ah, I don't love that. But there's stuff about it that I absolutely love. Um, right, and he wrote Warlock. Yeah, um, I am a fan of his. I like, all oh, right, yeah, The Arrival. Uh, not the best thing ever, but I liked it. Yeah, anyway. Um, let's see. And, yeah, so Ari Handel, right, he is also create. yeah, he also helped create Limitless with Chris Hemsworth. Um, he helped write Noah, this, and he plays a Kabbalah scholar in Pi. So, yeah, um, I, uh, and I think he was actually, he was, like, in special thanks to list. I, I just got done watching... Um, yeah, you know, since, since I own, um, Pie and Requiem for a Dream on DVD, I just watched those, and I believe he was thanked, I, I might be misremembering, but I think Ari Handel was thanked in the Requiem for a Dream and credits, so, yeah, um, and it is like, um, let's see, uh, yeah, I, I think I might talk some more about Ari Handel, but yeah, so, IMDb Trivia. According to director Darren Aronofsky, the film is inspired by the philosophical sci-fi films 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Matrix, Latin American writer Eduardo Galeano's fantasy story Memories of Fire, and the epic biography fairy tale Once Upon a Time in America. Now, I have not watched Memories of Fire, but the rest of those, I gotta say, are better movies than, than this. If you want visionary director who has things to say makes his own 2001 Space Odyssey, I'd say you're better off with Nolan's Interstellar. Yes, as saccharine as it gets. And definitely make sure you watch the original 2001 Space Odyssey. Just to make clear, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with making another version of it. And, yeah. I think Interstellar is good, bordering on great. It's not Nolan's best. And the film draws from Jewish Kabbalah, mind mythology, space travel, and brain surgery research. 
and let's see. Right, so there's a bunch, I copied in a bunch of stuff from Wikipedia, um, let's see. Right, he actually, yeah, he was working on this movie as far back as 2000 or 2001. You know, so yeah, it took a while, because it only came out in 2006. Originally, Brad Pitt was going to be the lead, and let's see. The, the um yeah and and Kate Blanchett was going to play the role currently played by Rachel Weiss and you know these are and and yeah Hugh Jackman ended up with a Brad Pitt role these are four tremendously talented actors and <clears throat> Yeah, so the, um, let's see, um, yeah, so originally it was going to have a budget of $70 million, and, yeah, um, Brad Pitt, you know, asked for screenplay revisions, and they didn't, he didn't get those, so he left, yeah, he left the project seven weeks before the first day of shooting. And, you know, he went to do uh, to Troy, Wolfgang Peterson's Troy, which I definitely think is a better movie than this. Um, and, yeah, um, the studio threatens to shut down the project. And... Yeah, Aronofsky sent the script to Russell Crowe, and they ended up working together on Noah later. Crowe was worn out from completing Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World. And, yeah, they actually... Yeah, they ceased production, and sets built for the production of the film, including a ten-story Mayan temple, were eventually auctioned off in addition to props and other items. And Pitt did say he was disappointed to leave... And added, I remain encouraged that the fountain will yet have its day. And let's see. Yeah. Um, without a studio and an actor, he decided to write a no budget version of the film using his experiences filming Pie and Requiem for a Dream with small budgets. And I would also definitely say those are better. But yeah, I'll get more into that um, later in the video. Y yeah. Uh, February 2004, Warner Brothers resurrected the project, began to court Hugh Jackman. The film received a second green light with a budget of $35 million, in part because of the director's willingness to leave costly set pieces out of the screenplay. And I don't know for sure, but I could imagine it would be much better if, the, you know, because, yeah, you know, Pie, Recommend for Dream, made on low budgets, but those were always supposed to be low budget. You know, he didn't have, like, this... You know, he didn't have a $70 million vision for, so, yeah. And, let's see, the, um, um, yeah, when Aronofsky saw The Matrix in 1999, he considered it a film that redefined the science fiction genre. He sought to make a science fiction film that would explore new territory in the genre, like The Matrix, Star Wars, and 2001 Space Odyssey. And, let's see... Yeah, uh, he had in mind a science fiction film that would go beyond the other films whose plots were driven by technology and science. The director said, we've seen it all. It's not really interesting to audiences anymore. The interesting things are the ideas, the search for God, the search for meaning. I don't know that I completely agree with him on that, but I do appreciate someone like saying, you know what, we've seen this, let's do something else. That's That's what mediums like film need because you can like you can keep making the same movie forever and there will be an audience for it you know there was an absurd amount of slasher movies during the 1980s i've seen many of them 
you know, they like they, there's a there's a thrill to watching them, but a lot of them have nothing. They they don't have any ideas. It's just they came up with some creative death scenes and you know, that that's basically it. So I really appreciate when when you go, you know, that I yeah, I already mentioned that I think the new Halloween trilogy, you know, they don't top the 1978 original, but that's not fair. You know, nothing is going to. Um, but, yeah, it, they're, they're better than all of the other sequels. Um, let's see. the um, and, and reboot and, and whatever. Um, you know, and, and it's not only... That's not the only reason why, but part of it is they have ideas, you know. They, they actually have things to say and questions to, to ask that you end up, you know, pondering the answers to. In 1999, when Aronofsky turned 30 years old, his parents were diagnosed with cancer. He began reflecting on human mortality. That was a really heavy-duty emotional time. I know it's a very young age, but turning 30 marks when your 20s are over and you start considering, wow, one of these days I'm actually going to die. And it's, yeah... It's very true. Uh, while his parents overcame cancer, he began to focus on the concept of a young man saving a loved one from a life-threatening disease. He shared the concept with Ari Handel, his undergraduate school roommate at Harvard University. Handel earned a PhD in neuroscience from New York University, but was uncertain about a future in neuroscience. He recalled the discussion. Darren and I just started talking about the story. We, did, we kept wanting to talk more about it as the story kept getting bigger, I decided to make some life choices to continue working with Aaron because it was so much fun. And that's, like, for sure, to some extent, this movie does show these, you know, but, but yeah, I can't help but wonder if a $70 million version, which obviously, you know, we're not going to get. This is not like the Snyder Cut, which you know, they had a lot of footage that, you know, could edit together. For this, you know, the sets are gone, McCready. That's, there's, it's not going to happen. But yeah, I can't help but wonder. I, I feel like that would probably have, have been better. I'm not sure, is this the only time where he had to really, you know, change based on the budget that... I don't remember reading that about the other ones, at least. But, but yeah. Um, yeah, something I wrote myself. It's about love, destiny, death, spirituality, the circle of life, nature, and our fragile existence in this world. You won't completely know what's going on until the end, and it leaves things open for interpretation. And, and yeah, that definitely... I, I don't know... I, I, I'm not sure I can completely grok why, but this is the only Aronofsky movie where I, when I look back on it, for, I, I always forget that the ending is the ending. I keep remembering it as happening much earlier in the film, and I, um, you, that's not a spoiler. You'll, you'll know why. If you've already watched it, you might know what, what I mean, and if not... You you're not gonna you're not gonna know what that actually means until you see it. Um, yeah, it's a it's I I think the the fact that it is this fractured thing I don't think works well for the movie. Uh, and I again, if if you think that it's perfect, I'm not telling you that you're wrong. I'm telling you we disagree. You know, almost everything I say in this video is my own opinion. Uh, let's see. But, but yeah, you know, it, mentally, when I think back on it, I, I keep trying to rearrange the order of, of scenes. And, yeah, um, you know, I'm not... So, again, I'm glad that he is a man with a vision. I'm, you know, I've, I've never... I have never been unhappy about watching a Darren Aronofsky movie. But, but yeah. Um, right, so some critic quotes. Uh, yeah, a lot of people say it's a love it or hate it film. Uh, it was dumbed down by the director because audiences didn't understand it. 
Um, let's see. This movie is indeed very hard to put into words. I can understand that a person may not like this film, no movie is loved by everyone, but I don't think that gives them the right to make biased opinions uh, let's see, on a movie that they don't even understand in the first place. They could have simply said in the review, I didn't understand the movie and can't make a comment. I 100% agree. It, I really, I'm very frustrated by reviews that are basically negative. Like, obviously, if people read the review and they didn't, they weren't confused or they just don't think that being confused is a reason to give a negative review to something, you know, the, the, um, even if, you know, if you don't read the reviews, if you only look at what people voted, a lot of people voting, you know, yeah, giving a very negative rating to a movie because they didn't understand it or they, it just wasn't their kind of thing, I really, I, I hope that we end up really getting away from that as, as a culture, as a, as a movie going culture in, in the West, because it is really a, it's a problem. Like, there are excellent movies that have a lot of downvotes because it was different from what people expected, and just, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, so, one user review said, I think the people who don't like the movie and give negative reviews are the ones who didn't understand it and don't like to think about deep topics. I am certain that I understood the movie. I love thinking about deep topics. I don't like being contrarian. Given that I spent six months watching my mother deteriorate from cancer without being able to stop the cancer until it killed her more than 20 years ago and I still haven't completely dealt with my feelings on it, it seems like I should be the ideal viewer for this. And I don't particularly like this movie. You know, I love the work of Hayao Miyazaki, Akira Kurosawa, Andrei Tarkovsky, Stanley Kubrick, David Cronenberg, and everything else Aronofsky. Again, haven't watched The Whale yet, but yeah. And this is not the only user reviewer like that. Some people seem to think that the only reason that people might not like this movie is because they don't understand it, and that all that is necessary is to explain their view of the movie to be clear, this movie is not bad because it is a puzzle, because it is difficult, or because there are a lot of different ways to interpret it. No one is stupid for not liking it, though I do think we have a problem in Western movie culture, especially America, where if a movie is confusing, it's likely to get negative reviews from general audiences, and sometimes also critics. Now, let's see... Uh, rough around the edges, it's difficult to tell what's real and what's just visual parallel. And, but, but yeah, you know, for, for sure, uh, before I finish up talking about the writing, there are ideas here, and I really appreciate that. Um, it's something that you can, you know, I, I looked at a bunch of different uh, reviews, and I did, you know, read, read what I could about, like, what, you know, what Aronofsky, well, Aronofsky himself has not been, he's, he's been fairly tight-lipped, as he's wanted, you know, he doesn't love explaining his movies necessarily. Um, but, but yeah, you know, reading various interpretations of it and such. Um, and yeah. There's clearly, there's thought put into it. Um, it's difficult. There, there are things about it that I can only really talk about once I get into spoilers that I think are problems for it. So, you know, if you if you just want that, skip ahead to, until the second, uh, what's it called, thoughts section. And let's see. Yeah, so... Moving on to the direction. So, yes, this was directed by Aronofsky, who, you know, yeah, um, other than this one, I have ranked all films directed by him, worst to best, I love all of them, Pi, Requiem for a Dream, The Wrestler, Black Swan, Mother, and Noah. Yes, I realize not everybody agrees with me on those last two picks. And... 
yeah, you know, grieving is one of those universal and yet taboo things. We will all do it at least once in our lives, if not for people, then for pets. So it's extremely important to do it well in media. And I definitely do appreciate at least one interpretation of this, you know, does do it really, uh, yeah, does do it quite well. And that is, like, when you read positive reviews, like, I don't think I read a single positive review that felt like, oh, you know, this person didn't really understand it, they're just afraid they'll look, they'll, they'll look bad. I, I feel like people who liked it but didn't understand it at all, it seems like they might just not have really submitted reviews. Like, um, you know, but again, the negative ones, some of those did understand what it's doing. But, but yeah, um... When you read positive reviews of this, like, a lot of them, it is basically that it really worked for them. They, they understood it, and it moved them. And I definitely, you know, again, that was, I think that was probably, well, let's see. The first time I watched it, I didn't understand it, but I did feel somewhat moved by it. The second time, I understood it a lot better, wasn't particularly moved... I think this is one of those movies that, for a number of people, once you've watched it once, like, this is maybe a movie, watch it once, watch it with someone who you can discuss it with and who's going to have, you know, be able to bring things to the conversation, and then, you know, consider maybe not watching it again, because when you watch it a second time and you know what happens in it, then it can really, you know... It's not going to play as well. And that's... Again, that's not a bad thing for a movie. The, you know, some movies you really should only try to watch once, you know. Uh, let's see. Yeah, actually, you know, it, so yeah, the first time I watched it, I couldn't follow it at all. Then I watched it again later and had no idea why I had any trouble following it at all. So, yeah, um... I can't really, I can't explain that. Uh, let's see. And yeah, so critic quotes. I will credit Aronofsky with creating a few very beautiful scenes in this movie. They would be lovely in a coffee table book, but serve no purpose in a film that elicits little compassion for its characters or understanding of its story. And I think it's a big problem. Like, the 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 characters... Yeah. Uh, let's see. Did I end up copying that in? I might not have copied that in. Um, oh, right. I copied it in further down, so I will get to it. But, yeah. Um... Not for everyone, but not for the usual reasons. I don't think it's a question of getting it or not getting it, but more a question of how much you are willing to go with it. It's not without its problems, it feels twice as long as it is, and it's like being in a state of intense mourning for the duration. It is also a brave and beautiful piece of cinema. Aronofsky wears his heart on his sleeve like wet, red wet stain, and I'm glad he fought for this project. And yeah, some have said, not a movie by the standard definition, it's more of a poem presented in a visual medium. That, I think, that might be my favorite quote from a critic about this movie. That is very true. And that is definitely something that some people really hated. Like, some people went into this expecting three acts, straightforward, you know, and that is not what it is. A poem presented in a visual medium, yes. Uh, let's see... Right, and, and this person also. I've heard that The Fountain is a poem, I've heard it is a symphony, I've heard it is a mural. If it were any of those things, it might have been complete. If Big Abe had figured out a way to tie this film together, he would have. The truth is, he heard the secret of the universe, tried to run back and tell everybody, but the secret trickled away as he ran, like water through his fingertips. By the time he got back, he found himself unable to convey the experience, like explaining the color blue to a blind man. The saddest thing about this film is Abe's inability to reconcile his fate, to have heard the funniest joke ever told, and not be able to share it with anyone. And that's also... 
very true. Um, so I am not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but you know, it fits with what came before. You might not realize that, you know, yeah, you might not realize right away how it fits, but it does. Um, I would definitely say. Uh, yeah, I uh, I like the ending. I I don't know why I'm always expecting the ending to be at a different point in the movie i guess just no yeah yeah i i i guess i understand why basically but yeah um let's see but but yeah you know it doesn't suddenly invent a new reason for it to to end the way that it does um and that brings us to the characters so I'm not entirely sure that I think, yeah, I, I think I'm gonna, there's some stuff about characters that I'm going to be talking about once I get into the, let's see, yeah, um, yes, so Hugh Jackman plays Thomas Creo, and he is a... Uh, okay, yeah, he's, you know, a, a, a doctor who wants to save his wife, and, let's see, yeah, and according to IMDb Trivia, Tom's last name is Creo, which means I believe, uh, I think, in Spanish. Hugh Jackman is incredibly talented. Um, I'm really, really glad that he works outside of comic book adaptations and that kind of thing. His performances in The Prestige and Prisoners are spectacular. I'm really glad that the relative failure of this movie did not lead to the end of his career. or any. I don't think this ended anybody's career, and I'm, I'm really glad, because they, they're all very, very talented, and just... Yeah, um, I think one could probably make a joke about that he really likes playing characters whose love interest is, you know, in in danger or, so, you know, yeah, um, and yeah, you know, a lot of his... Or maybe, I don't know, maybe it's just the stuff I've seen him in, but he seems to do a lot of the, the yeah, a lot of roles where he is frustrated and angry about something out of his control. And, I mean, he does a really, really excellent job with that. So, so yeah, you know, okay, so other than, yeah... X-Men movies, let's see, I have seen him in Chappie, where he's also, he's, he's a lot of fun in that one, uh, yeah, already mentioned Prisoners, um, uh, is that really it, already mentioned The Prestige, this, Van Helsing, which, Van Helsing is a terrible movie, but that's not his fault. He he really throws himself into the role. Really, I, I think every major actor in that really, really tries to, to make it work. And again, maybe it works for you. I just, it's way too campy for, for my tastes. And it's one of those movies that just, like, I watched it when it came out. The CG wasn't good then either. I wish that that was not a, a thing, you know, but, but yeah, and that, let's be honest, Steven, I forget his last name right now, but I'll find it, oh, right, I did also watch Swordfish, and wow, that movie's terrible, um, Steven Somers, I don't know if he still does, is he even still making movies? 
I don't think I've heard of anything. Uh, okay, he did something in 2013, and he's directing something coming up. Um, but, but yeah, you know, in the... Let's see, so you have the... Um, yeah, late 90s through the mid-2000s, he was not particularly eager to not overuse CG, even though, you know, I don't know, I guess maybe he himself thought that it would, that, that it did look better than everybody else thought it did. Anyway, Rachel Weiss plays Izzy Creo, a terminally ill woman, and... Ah, uh, is that a spoiler? Let's see. Yeah, um, Weiss, speaking to The Guardian, shared how working with di director Aronofsky, who was then in a relationship with her at the time of filming and release, was very different to who we are around the house. And yeah, I could definitely see... Yeah, I... I, I hope it didn't create a, a huge rift, but that's that's definitely a lot of... Yeah, a lot of us straight men, very, very different when we're working than when we are with the, the person that we're, you know, our, our partner. And, yeah, um, she doesn't... There's a very specific reason for why, but she is not given the easiest task, and I think she acquits herself rather well. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that it is, ultimately, it is a, ba a bit of a waste of her talent. Um, Jackman gets a bit more to, to chew on. And, and unlike, you know, Van Helsing and such, it's not the scenery. Ellen Burstyn plays Dr. Lillian Gazzetti, and I will never, I am never unhappy about seeing Ellen Burstyn in a Darren Aronofsky movie. Uh, she also doesn't have a lot. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the major actors in this really don't get that much to to do. Uh, Stephen McHattie is is in this, and yeah, great. Just yeah, and Mark Margolis. You know, this, at at this point, um, I don't think Darren Aronofsky was really willing to to make a movie if. Mark Margolis couldn't appear anywhere in it. Um, you know, he's not even in very much of uh, uh, Requiem for a Dream, but he's in there. You know, um, I forget, did they keep... Uh, let's see, so the next one would be Wrestler. All right, he is in Wrestler. Black Swan. Uh, is it maybe? Did he appear in Noah? I think that might be what I was thinking of. He is not in Noah, <clears throat> and he's also not in um, Mother or the um, um, the Whale. Now. And, and Cliff Curtis is also in this, and, you know, he's also always great. Um, now, one, uh, one critic noted, because of the budget, they couldn't reshoot scenes, get as many takes as they wanted, and that's why some of the acting is wooden, and that's, that makes a lot of sense to me. And so, yeah, um, there is some diversity in this. You know, I mentioned Mark Margolis. And I can't believe I already forgot his name. Cliff Curtis. Um, this is not the best, the most empathetic um, depiction of some of the diversity it features. And I will talk about that in the, um, the second thoughts section also. Now, let's see. Um, yeah, so, uh, the dialogue, um, at times it feels very, like, it's very much that there was, 
there are things that have to come across through the dialogue. So sometimes you have people saying th things that are a little weird or phrasing them in weird ways for it to work for the for the overall thing. But yeah, uh, you know, there are 26 entries in the MDB quote section and all of them are good. That brings us to the cinematography, which is handled by Matthew Libatique. And yeah, he That's right. Yeah, he's all he also did The Whale. He also did Venom, but someone had to. Um Let's see, is he... Yeah, he did Noah. Uh, Cowboys and Aliens, which, if nothing else, is well shot. Black Swan. So yeah, the, the they have worked together on other things. Um, did they work together before this? Let's see. The um, Yes, Requiem for a Dream... And Pi were also collaborations between... So, so yeah. Um, clearly, you know, he, he shoots stuff the way that Aronofsky likes. And, yeah. Um, you know, I, f I feel like this is one of those movies... What was it Mark Twain said? A, a, um, a great book is something that everybody is supposed to have read but nobody wants to read. I feel like this film is one of those where thinking back on it or hearing other people discuss it is more appealing than watching it yourself because it looks really good, but when you sit down and, and watch... Now, um, yeah, so one critic quote about that. Uh, ugly, monochromatic, it looks okay but not good. It was popular at the time but does not fit the movie, and yeah, I wish I had a really strong counter-argument, but it's it's absolutely true, and it's one of those things, the moment I saw it, I, now, now I can't unsee it. So the editing was handled by Jay Rabinowitz, and let's see, the, um, um, Right, he also edited The Tree of Life, which has some of the, the same, yeah, haven't watched that one, but I hear it has some of the same. Um, you know, this is this is a movie I wouldn't have watched if not for Aronofsky, so I'm probably not watching, so yeah. Yeah, that's right, he also edited Requiem for a Dream. Did he edit Pi? I don't, he did not edit Pi, apparently. He edited uh, 8 Mile. But yeah, um, the editing is a big part of why the movie is like it is. And as such, I don't know that I can necessarily say that I personally like it. But, you know, trying to take a step back and, and see it as, you know, well, as a, as a critic. It is very, very well done. Um, there is some... The movie has this, what's the word, without spoiling, um, let's just say there's there's some very creative editing, which is, of course, you know, at, at this point in, you know, in Aronofsky's career, creative cinematography and creative editing were a big part of his his style you know i forget i feel like does he maybe tone it down for wrestler i, f I forget but but uh yeah you know at this time it was a really big part and yeah um if it's the kind of thing where you know really if you find yourself early on not liking the the editing you know, if you're not, if you're watching it by yourself and no one's going to be hurt by you not finishing watching, if it bothers you early on, you may want to stop watching because it's not going to, you know, it's not equally out there throughout the movie. That would be just 
beyond exhausting, but it is not going to... It, it, it does like that kind of editing, and, you know, yeah. Um, I can't really claim that it's not effective. I don't personally find it as effective as, for example, Requiem for a Dream, which, you know, yeah. I, I'm... I'm not one of the people who love that movie just because, oh, you know, that, I haven't seen that editing before because when it came out, like, apparently a bunch of teenagers were saying, oh, best movie ever because it has editing that, like, you know, I forget, was that what they call, I, th I think they called it hip-hop editing, and I, I'm not saying the movie is good just because of that, but I do think he uses that editing to really gr strong effect. Um, that brings us, so yeah, um, the, the box office, the, the budget was 35 million and the box office was 16 million. So this was very much a box office bomb. And I mean, in a way, like it's kind of, it's wild that, that he actually, he, he wanted this in regular theaters. Like I could, I could understand like this movie if if it's like specifically for like the the art movie crowd you know but no this this was released as a normal theater you know yeah because it's really not it's nowhere near as like i don't know if you want to call pie and requiem for dream mainstream but a mainstream audience can get a lot out of those movies you know and yeah, um, some of it was filmed in just Montreal or Philadelphia, but some of it was filmed in Guatemala. And let's see, that brings us to the music. So yeah, this was, uh, the score was composed by Clint Mansell and... Yeah, the you know, they like working together. Um and you know, that is like the the score really is is great. I'm I'm a big fan of Clint Mansell. Especially for these. So so yeah. Let's see. Black Swan Wrestler Um And I especially like the the score, you know, his score for Requiem for a Dream. Like, that's just amazing. And I don't just say that because it's, you know, appeared in roughly a million trailers. It legitimately is very, very effective. Now, there are 46 and a half minutes of the soundtrack here on YouTube. And, yeah, it's worth listening to, you know, without, yeah. Uh, yeah, some say the score is the best part of the film. It's, yeah, maybe, yeah. Uh, the score deserved an Oscar. Clint Mansell and the Kronos Quartet have, again, provided the score, and if anything, it's better than the fantastic Requiem for Dream soundtrack. Again, this may be because the subject matter of the fountain was so much more palatable, but it seems to flow a lot smoother than the previous film. Strongly impacted soundtrack score by Clint Mansell and Scottish rock band Mogwai. Uh, Clint Mansell's beautiful and imaginatively conceived score, an elegant work of experimentation performed by Kronos Quartet, Scottish rock band Mogwai, speaks volumes more about what the characters feel and how their triumphs and tragedies affect their emotional states than any of the dialogue in the film. Very true, in my opinion. Uh, right, so, yeah, some people uh, did not particularly like it. Uh, saying Mansell has no classical training... The score is too simple. They should have used classical music that's evocative, like the movie Tree of Life. Uh, and a different person said, I agree it's simple, but it helps me focus on the drama. Now, let's see. That brings us... Yeah. Um, the pacing really, like... Some people will, you know, if you are fascinated with what you're watching, then it doesn't feel slow. 
But if you're frustrated and and feel like what you know, where's the story? When is the story gonna like really take off? Like I'm used to in an American movie. Yeah, you're probably you know that's that's when it feels like it's twice as long. Like again, you know, this time sitting down, I knew pretty much everything I was gonna get out of this movie. It didn't feel it it. Yeah, it felt its length. Maybe it felt like half an hour longer, but it did not feel twice its length. Actually, yeah, I'm not sure I've ever felt that it was twice its length. The first time I watched, I was just like, and I think that's something like I I'm I'm not saying you know oh I'm special. You know, my father taught me to appreciate great cinema, and I, you know, I acknowledge a lot of people don't have that. They are they aren't taught. They're just they see a lot of American like. Some American movies are amazing, but a lot of American movies are junk food. And if all you ever have is junk food and someone prepares a gourmet meal, you're not going to be able to appreciate it. But yeah, the movie is 90 and a half minutes long without end credits and only 97 long with them. Uh, let's see, I haven't prepared but I guess I could see if I can really quickly find a point that I would say you should give it at least that much time um I suppose yeah maybe give it until 35 minutes in if at 35 minutes in you do not care to see what happens in the rest of it then you might as well stop watching Again, unless you're, like, watching with someone. And, yeah. So, the best element is tied between the metaphors, the spiritualism, and the visuals. And, for sure, for some people, you will want to own it. You will want to be able to rewatch parts of it. And, yeah. So, for me, the worst aspect, I just don't really like it in engages me on a spiritual and intellectual level but it does not engage me on an emotional level and that is not something that i i don't say that lightly about a darren aronofsky movie you know some i've you know some people say that oh he goes way too hard for the emotional you know side and and i get that for for sure you know um you know, don't if if you're already like a little sad, or you know, if you feel like you maybe need to pick me up, don't watch a Darren Aronofsky movie. Don't don't it'll, you'll regret it. You know, and yeah, um, but and uh, again, I'm not saying his movies are better than ones that aren't as intense. Uh, you know, ones that are more subtle. But but yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, um, I think I'm going to make sure to write that in case I need it in the future. Engages on a spiritual and intellectual, but not emotional one and there we go. Um, yeah, so, uh, that's not how everybody feels, and I, I really, I don't, you know, I really want to underline, if you are someone who watches this movie and it just really gets to you, I'm glad, I'm glad that you have that, I don't want to take it away from, you know, I, this is not a movie... I would never tell someone, you know, that this, that, that the movie is terrible and shouldn't be watched or shouldn't, you know, I, I make this review to help, I'm trying to help people figure out if they would be, if, if it's something they would like or not. But for sure, like, it's a movie that deserves to exist, you know, and, um... Okay, so huge tonal shift, but a couple of movies that I don't particularly, I'm not particularly happy exist. 
Ah, uh, crap. What's it? Yeah, yeah. I, I just got to make sure that I have the title right. Yes. Saving Silverman. Uh, wait, is it... Is that a different... Huh. Uh, maybe... Ah, crap. Because I don't remember the title offhand. And it's not that I have something inher 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 inherently against Dennis Dugan. I think he did a great job on the original Problem Child. Like, if you haven't watched that in a while, like, I'm not saying it's a good movie, but it's effective. Like, if you, you know, it's a, it's a kid's movie, and it's basically about mayhem, but it's... It's pretty well directed mayhem. Like it's shot and edited well. There are some great reaction shots in that movie. Like just the the yeah, you know, if you haven't watched in a while and you don't completely remember, but you feel like oh, I kind of like that, give it another shot because it's legitimately yeah. Okay, so I guess that wasn't the other one was not directed by Dennis Dugan, but I remember there's someone. Apparently isn't the, it's not that writer, is it the other writer? Oh, crap, uh, okay, I am going to, there's more than one Bride Wars? Oh, oh, uh, there's a, uh, is this, um, this is a Chinese, there is a Chinese version of Bride Wars. I didn't realize they... Oh, Angela Baby is in it. Who I am only aware of because she appeared in Hitman. Codename 47, I think. The... No, wait, that's the game. Uh, Hitman Agent 47. Yeah, the, the movie. Um, let's see. I just, I, I feel like I know the title, so I'm just going to make sure... National Security... Oh, that is also Dennis Duke, and I don't know why I didn't see it before. I don't think that the movies Saving Silverman and National Security are good. I think they are a cultural negative. And again, you're free to disagree with me, but I just want to say there are movies that I don't personally think, you know make things any better, and this is not one of them. I th I'm glad that this movie exists. Now, uh, yeah, so if you look at uh, other, you know, people who don't like it, the, the, the criticisms that aren't just from people who didn't, you know, who are upset that they didn't understand it, the, the criticisms are that it's pretentious and boring. And I don't know that I completely agree but i can i can see what they mean yeah and and that's definitely you know if that's something that you think the movie might if you think that watching the movie you might feel like it's pretentious and boring this is not a movie for you this is definitely gonna yeah um so yeah the thing i was most worried about was that it would just be too aloof for me to engage with at all and that was not the case Thing I was most looking forward to was more Aronofsky, and that's like I'm never gonna, I'm never unhappy about watching Aronofsky. It's it's not, I I um, I will eat my words if it ever happens, but so far it just hasn't. The guy keeps coming up with interesting ideas. He's one of my favorite directors. He keeps coming up with interesting ideas where it's just like wow, I a big budget adaptation of the Bible story Noah written and directed by one of the most like well-known atheists in Hollywood like that's just how do you how do you even come up with that yeah it had a hundred and twenty five million dollar budget how do you because he doesn't believe in a word of it. Like, he doesn't think that it... And, and he's still, you know, and it's two hours, 18 minutes long. It stars some of the greatest actors. Just, I... 
the moment that I heard that he was doing Noah, I knew I had to watch it. And that's not like, you know, there's a lot of directors who could have made a Noah movie. And I'd be like, okay, <laughs> whatever floats your boat. But I'm not going to spend time and money on it. Like, I, I did not expect to be challenged and, and have, like find myself going wow that's interesting at a noah story like we all know the story what what could you possibly do with that that's gonna be at all interesting in 2014 and he managed so yeah if, if you know in in case you forget i you know it is my actually hold on um did i now I forget exactly where I placed it, but uh, yeah, it is my, Noah is my favorite movie of his. So yeah, the trailer gives too much away of this movie, and I don't think you should watch it before watching the movie, unless you're like, just not gonna apply the the knowledge you gain from watching the, the trailer. You know, if you, if you sit watching the movie and like, well, that hasn't happened yet, so, you know, that is gonna ruin the movie for you. That might ruin the movie for you, at least. Um, it's not really a trailer that tells you what the movie is like to the extent that you didn't, you know, like it gives you, it, it technically represents parts of the movie, yeah. Uh, I don't think, this is, this is a very thankless, it's a thankless job to make a trailer for this movie that's trying to draw in a mainstream audience. That is just not, I, I am honestly very... I admire whoever edited this trailer because they tried. They really made a sincere effort to get a mainstream audience interested in watching this movie and they 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 do pretty well. It's it's yeah. Uh the cover and poster don't give too much away. Uh some of the covers and posters are worth looking up on IMDb. This is definitely a movie that could have been a music video, and I'm not saying it's that that would be better, but I do think that there's a lot of people who would like the music video that don't like the movie. Um, so yeah, uh, the um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know that I would necessarily say that it should be like shorter um and certainly like i really appreciate the restraint to make it only 90 minutes long when it's this like you know like like as i quoted a critic earlier saying it's basically a poem in visual form you know he could you, you know yeah darren aronofsky could easily have made this movie much much longer but you know yeah it actually is now, uh, I searched here on YouTube, I found three clips, one trailer, three music videos, which makes a lot of sense, all of them fan ones, I believe, uh, two tributes, 12 review analysis, two documentaries, three reactions, and actually also the commentary track by the director, which is free, because they didn't, they wouldn't let him do one for the DVD, so he recorded one in his living room and put it on his website. So that's, yeah. Um, have I said yet that I love Darren Aronofsky in a, you know, no, no homo, but just like, as if there's anything wrong with homosexuality. Um, yeah, I, I... I can't see myself ever not watching one of his movies, you know, no matter how negatively received it is, because there's going to be something in there that is, like, there's, there are visuals in this movie that I remembered for years after watching it, even though there were other movies that I watched, liked when I watched them, and forgot all about, like, sometimes I will, I will look at some of the earliest videos I've recorded, and I'll be like... I watched that movie? I don't even remember that... I didn't remember that movie even existed, much less watching it, much less doing a video on it. So, you know, but but Aronofsky, he always puts something in your brain that is not going away anytime soon, if at all. 
On Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 52%, which means it's rotten. Based on 206 reviews, um, 108 of them are fresh. So yeah, it's you know just over 50%, but but the audience score is 74%. And this is actually a case where I think you know I am not the the fact that I'm I'm just gonna double check because I guess it is possible that I just that it was a nightmare that it's not real. No. The movie Venom has a 29% critic score and 80% audience score. Um, it's a movie that 256 critics rated rotten. Um, only 107 rated it fresh, which is still a lot. Uh, the average critic rating is 4.50 out of 10, but the average audience rating is 4.1 out of 5. More than 25,000 ratings. It's an 80%. Like, you know there are other movies, right? You don't You don't have to only watch Venom. Like, there are so many movies. And I guess if you only watch Venom, yeah, I guess you might think it's an amazing movie. Um, anyway, that's a case where uh, the fact that there is such a discrepancy between the critics' score... And the audience score uh, makes me lose faith in humanity a little bit. Not as much as the the two Dennis Dugan movies I mentioned, but a little bit. Uh, but this movie, I feel like I it makes a lot of sense to me that, yeah, seventy four percent of the two hundred fifty thousand plus ratings by audiences, it you know that that that's positive. I that makes a lot of sense, and I feel like this is maybe also a movie that you especially seek out. If it is the the kind of thing that's really going to work for you. Because once, you know, if you watch the trailer, you're going to be misled. But if you just hear what the movie is like, you're either going to steer clear or you're going to, you know, dive in deep. And, yeah. Uh, so the consensus is The Fountain, a movie about metaphys mis bleh, metaphysics, universal patterns, biblical symbolism, and boundless love. Is visually rich but suffers from its own unfocused ambitions. Unfocused? Huh. I'm not sure I see at all how it's unfocused. See, that kind of makes me think that maybe a lot of these critics didn't completely understand what was going on in the movie. I would not say it's unfocused. So, so yeah, if you're someone who read that and was like, ah, I don't want to watch an unfocused movie, I would not say this is unfocused. Um, not at all. It's it's kind of the opposite of that. Wow. Okay, I complete. I read that like weeks ago when I started preparing this video. I completely unfocused. Yeah, I'm. I gotta say, I I really feel like that. That's born out of a misunderstanding of what the movie is trying to do. Anyway, uh, the average user rating is 3.8 out of 5. And anything over 3.5 out of 5 is considered positive on, you know, that, that makes it, you know. So yeah, 26% out of the 100%, you know, since it's 74% positive, 26% voted lower than 3.5, basically, is, is, the, is how they add it up. On Metacritic, it has a 51 critic score based on 36 critic reviews, but the audience score is 7.9 based on 555 ratings. Yeah, that, that does, again, make a lot of sense. And it, again, it doesn't mean that everyone loves... Yeah, and you know, of the 36 critics... 15 are positive, 14 are mixed, 7 are negative. Now the um, user... Wow. Yeah, okay, so of the 500... Oh, now it's 556 since last I copied in. 435 of them are positive. 54 are negative, 67... Uh, 54 are mixed, 67 are negative. And... Yeah, sorry, uh, short fuse, I guess. Uh, yeah, 196 people submitted reviews, so that kind of tells you how it's a it's a movie people care about, basically. Wow, I forgot this number. 
Um, there are 1,043 IMDb user reviews for a movie from 2006. Like, there, there are movies that are more recent that have way less than, than that. So, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good level of engagement, is what they call that in the, um, in the scientific field. Uh, yeah, there, without spoilers, there are 783. I read the top voted 100, including spoiler ones, since I knew before I, before this viewing. Um, right, uh, yeah, okay, so, of the top 100, you know, the, the ones most popular of IMDb user reviews, 15 gave it 1 out of 10, so there is still a chunk of people who cannot stand it. Um, 2 gave it 2 out of 10, 4 gave it 3 out of 10, 5 and 4 out of 10, 1 gave it 5 out of 10, 3 gave it 6 out of 10, 5 gave it 7 out of 10, 7 gave it 8, 19 gave it 9 out of 10, and 36 gave it 10 out of 10. So that is still, you know, there are still more that really love it than, yeah. Did I? I guess I just, okay, I'll, um, I can find it. Uh, yeah, so here we go. Um... Okay, uh, let's see. How do I fill the dead air? Um, in total, there are 291 links in the uh, I'm to be external links section. Holy crap. Only 110 of them are in English and work. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and this has a 7.2 out of 10 on IMDb, based on 240,443 votes. Um, yeah, so 21.2 gave it 8, 19.7 gave it 7, 17.7 gave it 10, 14.3 gave it 9, 6.3 gave it 5, 3.3 gave it 4, 2.3 gave it 1, 2 percent, yeah, 2.0 gave it 3, 1.4 gave it 2. So that's still a lot that gave it very low ratings. And it was nominated for 39 awards and won 9 of them. So... Let's see, uh, yeah, there, I'm not going to go over all of the ones it was nominated for, but let's see, uh, it won, uh, yeah, Clint Mansell won a Chicago Film Critics Association Award, or a Kafka, if you will, for Best Original Score, and which is Kafka-esque. A, uh, let's see, the sound editing won a Director's Guild of Canada, or, and Golden Schmoes for most underrated movie of the year, since the critics didn't, yeah, yeah, um, let's see, and, um, Hamptons International Film Festival won the Feature Film Prize in Science and Technology. And it was one of New York Film Critics Online 2006 Top Films of the Year. It, uh, yeah, it won another for Best Original Score. And on, yeah, Online Film Critics Society, of course. Um, and yet another for the soundtrack, the, the Public Choice Award for World Soundtrack Awards. But 
Darren Aronofsky also won a Yoga Award for Worst Foreign Director. To each their own, I guess. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, let's see. So, the, the special effects, there is very little CGI. Uh, the majority of the effects are unique and organic, as they are quite simply not faked or staged. It's microphotography of chemical reactions in Petri dishes. So, it doesn't date badly, or even at all. Like, you can, wa you can watch it today. It is now 17 years old. Or 16... It's, anyway. Yeah. When you look at the effects, like, it does not look any, like... Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, some people say the space stuff looks great. The best of the visuals in the whole film. And, yeah. Uh... I, you know, like I said, so, so, yeah, this movie came out two years after Van Helsing. So this was a time when big movies were way overusing CGI that even at the time didn't look great. I think I actually watched, did I watch Van Helsing in the theater? I think I might have. And, like, it's not that, you know, this is, let's see. There's got to be something I watched around that time in the theater. It, actually, yeah, I'll just refer to, to the, you know, this does such a, a, a much better, it's a much better decision to just, you know, like, as far as I know, there is a little CG, but... Most of the stuff that you would think is CG is microphotography of Petri dishes. And then there is some stuff that you might think, well, I mean, it would be easier to do CG, but it's actually practical effects. And, you know, yeah, that I've seen behind the scenes footage that confirms it's actually... It's actually practical effects, even if it looks so convincing that it's just... Completely, it seems completely impossible that it could be, but but yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I will put I think two links, yeah, in the description box to other videos that I think are worth watching on it. Um, so yeah, I I'm not sure about other countries, but here in Western Europe, you can stream this movie on Disney Plus. It does not have any special features, um, but, you know, there are some for free here on YouTube, so, uh, yeah, if... Um, so, I suppose... Yes. Um, I rate this seven quests to conquer death out of ten, so, yeah, you know... I've said a lot of critical things about it. It's still a 7 out of 10. It could be a lot worse. So, yeah. Um, I do think, uh, you know, like I said, it's not my favorite movie exactly, but I think it holds up fine. I think it, you know, it's it's as watchable today as it was in 2006, with the one exception perhaps being the, the monochromatic. Yeah. Um, I think... It is the, the, you know, if you if you watched it way back then and you're, like, in a different place in your life, maybe watch it again. Um, you might have a completely different feeling about it. Um, let's see. But, but yeah, you know, when, when I first watched it, my mom had already died of cancer. So I, I've always been the ideal audience for this. And now that I actually completely understand the movie, I can confirm... It's just not really my kind of thing. So, um, yeah. Ranking all films directed by Darren Aronofsky, worst to best, 
The Fountain, Pi, Requiem for Dream, The Wrestler, Black Swan, Mother, and Noah. And this is the only Aronofsky movie I've watched so far that I don't love. And yeah, so the rest of the video will contain spoilers. So I'm putting up the spoiler thingamajig. And that brings us to the very first spoiler section. Notes taken while watching. And yeah, uh, in case you skipped directly here, this section will be pretty much exclusively um, MST3K. And it's also going to make absolutely zero sense to you if you haven't watched the movie. So yeah. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, so so um, Tom, the... Actually, yeah, I... Um, I might, in, unless I forget, I think I will be referring to the three characters played by Hugh Jackman as Head Tom Kistador, Chief of Tomcology, and Top Tom Knot. So yeah, um, Head Tom Kistador checks the band in his pocket. Is it the real deal? Rings true. I see him. Well, I see every pore on your face. Yo, Darren, chill it with the extreme close-ups, please. And the head Tom Kistador briefly becomes the crowd surfador. Let's see. And... Yeah, you know, the fire sword is swung at head Tom Kistador. And he goes, no, as he wakes up. Yeah, cliffhangers suck. Except the movie Cliffhanger, it's surprisingly watchable. Let's see. And, and Izzy, I, th I think, is the one who says, I'm strong enough to live as a tree. And, you know, the, the, um, ah, I forget his, um, I'm going to find the actor's name real quick. So that the, uh, yeah, uh, Ethan Supli, um, Manny, uh, Beardo, comes up to, to Don and says, uh, or, or, Tom, we can operate on, on Donovan now. One sec, I got to turn to get some really obvious Jesus symbolism with the door. Done. Let's go. And and Ellen Burstyn confronts, you know, Chief of Tomcology. Tommy, I'm concerned. I think the medical talk in the previous scene lost like 70% of the audience. The snowballs were funny. I, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, you know, he, he comes home. Where where are you? You know, he he like I think he has a meta moment where he realizes, oh no, I'm Hugh Jackman in a movie, and you know obviously my love interest is gonna be in substantial danger. So you know he goes around the house. Izzy, where are you? Uh, you know, is Izzy in here? Is he not? Yeah, um, and then like you know he sees the open window. And he, like, pokes his head through snowballs in the face. And Izzy laughs. And so do I. That was legitimately funny. And, and I think he appreciated the, the humor of the, of the situation as well. Like, that is not what he... He did not see that coming. That, that's like a, a, a prank type of joke, really. You know, it just... You know, he's like, oh no, you know, what, what has happened to my wife? And snowballs in the face. Just, yeah. Let's see. And, and, you know, as they're going back in, you know, she also, um, that's when he throws the snowball at her, and he's like, you have to come in, you're, you're, you're not safe, oh, here you go, and it snowballs to the face, so, you know, I can see why they like each other, they have, you know, under the right circumstances, that their sense of humor is very 
complementary of, of each other, uh, you know, and, you know, and he realizes, you know, wh where's your shoes? Is he, it's keep, it's keep on your toes and a cool head. It's not keep your toes cool. And let's see. Yeah. And I, I like, you know, <laughs> you know, she sees that his wedding ring is off. And so she asks, is she a redhead? Like, he must be cheating. That's why he doesn't have the, the wedding ring on. And then she says, if you can't wait, you can't wait. You know, because she's dying and he wants to move on. So he's having sex with redheads, taking off his wedding ring. You know, I suppose she realized at some point having a sense of humor wouldn't kill her. That's what the tumor's for. And the, let's see. That's how I cope. That's how I cope with the with the cancer death. Is humor. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and you know, Tom is is on the phone. What, what happened? You wouldn't believe me if I, you know. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Honestly, I can't believe you, Tom. Film is a visual medium. And. You know, we, we see Stephen McHattie self-flagellating. That's actually how he reacts every time he loses his keys. And... I swear, this movie is like 30% Tom being frustrated at stuff not going as he wants. Like, sit down and actually count how many times he goes, No! And, like, knocks something over. Or is, like, you know, angry that things aren't... Yeah. All of your countrymen are dead, killed by the budget cuts. And, you know, d d Chief of Tomcology was reading about head Tom Kistador, and he, like, you know, suddenly, you know, is, is distracted. The, the EK, EKG machine is beeping. I hate when someone's death keeps me from reading a good book. Which is why I usually just keep reading. What? They're not gonna know. And he says no like nine times and then don't die, don't die. Honestly, I have long since lost track of counting how many times I've shouted that at Plant Life. And that is it for this section. So that brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. So let's see. Uh, I am really glad that... Um, I might have already said, but yeah, I'm really glad that, that Darren Aronofsky, you know, he felt like he had something to offer here. I'm glad he got to make, you know, it, it wasn't completely the movie that he originally envisioned, but he did get to make some, you know, it, it would, I'm, I would rather have him direct a movie that ultimately I personally didn't, it wasn't really for me and a number of people apparently didn't like, than him go the rest of his life and just be like, oh, I wish I could have done, you know. Because, yeah, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey is inspirational. Like, it's, it's, if you haven't watched it, like, <laughs> maybe don't make it the first Kubrick thing you watch. Because he is, at, it, it's one of his less accessible ones. You know, start with something that's a bit more mainstream. But it, it, it is an amazing movie. Like, as a teenager, I watched it maybe five times. And there were like, there were so many things that I didn't really understand as such, but I was like, this is amazing, you know, and it, it makes me think, you know, so it, it actually, it, me and, me and one of my friends would watch, like, I swear we had the weirdest taste in movies because we'd like watch Stanley Kubrick and then like, you know, the, the, um, Ah, crap. I can't believe I'm blanking on the, uh, Jason X. You know, we, we literally, like, I think we might have watched both of those movies at least once in the same day. 
I don't know. I, I, I know you're asking, and I don't have an answer for you. I have no idea why it was such the, these, these extremes, you know. I mean, I can still watch Jason X today, but, like, I'd rather watch something. That, okay, that's not true. Um, moving on. Anyway, the, the, um, uh, let's see. That brings us, uh, let's see. Yes, so, some critic quotes. Um, yeah, this person gave it a 9 out of 10. This film has really hooked me despite its flaws. Tommy and especially Izzy are too broadly drawn as characters. In the DVD commentary, Aronofsky admits he wanted them to be archetypes, so their love story lacks the little details and specificities that might have made it really emotionally vivid and put the film over the top for those critics who hated it for the complicated and ambiguous trio of timelines. Really, the movie isn't about Tommy and Izzy, but about Tommy and his own denial of death. Izzy's Mortality is just a vehicle for Tom to confront his own, so it's another movie in which the female lead is basically a masculine projection, and that maybe is its real flaw. Let's see. Um... Uh, actually, yeah, yeah, um... But Tommy's journey through grief to, well, you'll see, is still moving for me. And yes, it might be because of the soundtrack, which works for this film as no soundtrack ever has before, tying together the three separate timelines into one emotional arc. It's also visually gorgeous. During the production, the planned use of computer graphics had to be scrapped for macro photography for budgetary reasons. And thank... Did I say micro photo... I meant macro photo... Wow. I do know the difference as long as you don't ask me for any details in explaining the difference for budgetary reasons, and thank God, because the results are beautiful and unlike any, anything else I've seen on film. Overall, even though I couldn't put the pieces together logically as I was watching it, I found that there was an emotional logic to the film that was deeply satisfying. Although I like to analyze the heck out of films, this is one that really does work well if you just let it watch over you. I think this movie would have been like... If, yeah, the something that really uh, keeps me from, from loving the movie as much and engaging with it emotionally is the fact that they are just so broadly drawn. Like, I know almost nothing about these two people other than that she's okay with dying. Um, he doesn't want anything to die ever. And he's like an oncologist. Like, that's basic. Like, I can't tell you very much. You know, um, in the future scenes, he's at peace uh, with the with the idea that, um, you know, yeah. Uh, in the in the past, he is um, willing to die. I guess all I guess all three of them are willing to die for Izzy. Well, maybe not so much Tomcologist, but yeah, just there's so, there's just so little for me to latch on to with the characters. And I think that would have, because I am passionate about all other major characters in Darren Aronofsky movies. You know, I, I feel like I know who the mother is in Mother. You know, there's, there's enough little quirks to her character that I, I, feel like I, you know, she's, like, I could, I could construct a conversation with her in my head, and I just don't know, like, um, I get that it's, it's drenched in the, the, uh, the cancer thing, but, I mean, what were they like before? Um, I mean, presumably he wasn't so obsessed before the cancer, and, you know, Darren Aronofsky likes, you know, obsessive characters. I feel like the rest of them, I I understand better why, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, I suppose we don't really know who... Um, I'll find... I'll have it in just a few seconds, I'm certain. Um, 
let's see, there we go. So, um, in Pi, the lead character is named Maximilian Cohen. I feel like I, you know, yeah, I, I don't actually, I don't know, um, I know very little about Max before the headaches, before the obsession, but I still feel like there's a little, just, just enough for me to latch onto and just really get into the, the character, and that's just not the case here. Like, who was Izzy before she became, before the cancer, you know, so thoroughly took over that she knew she was going to die and she was ready to die? Like... I know who my mother was before the cancer, you know, I know, because, yeah, I, cancer changes people, it just does, you know, um, and not only physically, um, I know who she was in those last months, and I know who she was before, and if I only knew what she was like in the, those last few months, you know, she wouldn't be as important to me as she is, um, I just, yeah, I, um, I feel like, and, and that's also the thing, you know, but part of the, the reason that he made the movie is that he, he started to think about his own mortality and he wanted to, to try to cope with that. He already knew who he was before that, but, you know, so, so he got too into, okay, we're only going to focus on that. I'm not asking for much, just a few brief little, you know, what did Izzy like other than, you know, writing about conquistadors and researching conquistadors? Like, that's... Is she, like, was she an author? Like, does she have, like, multiple published books that are all about her diving deep into understand? Like, you don't have... It doesn't have to be a big part of the movie, but just have, like... Maybe he, you know... Yeah, just, you know, when they talk about the book, maybe he asks, is it like, you know, mention one or two other titles of hers? And she maybe, and, and yeah, and she says, no, back then I was this and that. Now, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with the fact that I'm going to die soon. So now I'm writing based on that, you know, because that's, that's what I, that's what I would assume. I, I think she wrote the book based on, specifically on the fact that she's going to die, you know. But the, the, yeah, you know, I, I, I can engage with it intellectually, I can engage with it spiritually, but I cannot engage with it emotionally. I do not know these people. And the, the concept of trying to conquer death by itself without characters that I get into I, yeah, um, I can't myself get, um, now, let's see, um, okay, so this is, yeah, this, this is a negative review, this person gave it a 3 out of 10, and watched it back in 2006, a pretentious mess of a movie, every line is either whispered or screamed to add non-existent weight to an already sloppy script, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I, yeah, there's a lot of whispering and screaming in this, which is just, yeah. Um, basic narrative techniques are eschewed for the sake of artiness, but without them, the film becomes a mishmash of unclear scenarios and one-dimensional characters. Although some scenes were visually impressive, the flatness of the characters and the one-note performances of the leads left me cold. Jackman cries or acts bitter for the entire film, and Wise basically stands around and smiles. How can I care about the characters when they have zero personality and development? Um, let's see. Um... And this is where he completely loses me. Giving the audience no explanation of the who, what, where, when, and why of a scene, and forcing them to sort out the details, is plain irresponsible. 
I would love to know what he thinks is going to happen due to that irresponsibility. Because, like, um, let's see, if you're irresponsible about watching your children enough, they might get hurt. Uh, if you're irresponsible with the economy, you know, yeah, we're seeing what... <sighs> Shit, now I sound like I'm blaming Biden for the... the don't I? Um, anyway, yeah. If you're irresponsible with the economy, that can have significant... I, I do not blame Biden for the, you know... Honestly, if Trump were president, things would probably be worse. He, he finds a way to make things worse. Um, irresponsibility without consequences. I mean, is that even irresponsibility? I feel like... Anyway, anyway um, let's see... Those who like it feel smart, and those who don't are made to feel stupid or inferior in some... Ah, that's it. He's, he, he, it's irresponsible because he's afraid that some people might feel stupid for not getting a movie. <laughs> I've never seen a film so convinced of its own importance. And let's see. And the movie is hurt by its own ambition. And I, this is also a really, um, most of the movie is two people talking in shot, reverse shot. I hate to say it, but yeah, um, that's, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know how, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go over. So basically, the two major theories I've heard are, one, that the past story, Mayan story, is real, and that all three stories have the same two lovers reincarnated. And the second theory I've heard is the past is a story written by Izzy. The future is what Tom imagines in the present. The present and only the present is real. And, you know, basically it's, it's visualizing what Tom thinks of, uh, like his, his gradual um, processing of how he feels about her death. Now, let's see. Huh. Right, so this was actually, yeah, I wrote this based on a previous viewing, and I didn't really feel it this time, but I guess I'll go, yeah. One of the first things that struck me while watching this is that when it jumps between the different lives that the couple have led, while it did not make it difficult for me to follow the narrative, did completely prevent my emotional engagement with the individual generations. Maybe the idea is that I'm supposed to be emotionally invested with the overall quest, but the first small chunk of the first generation that we see had me getting emotionally invested in the two people in the generation. When it cuts to another generation, basically it has to start over on getting invested. Maybe if the people, maybe if the movie immediately, uh, actually, yeah, let's see. The movie does immediately make it about the quest. Yeah, I think it failed to also make it about the, the people. I felt much more while watching Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which, which is also a movie that jumps around. I'm not saying that every movie needs to have me deeply engaged with the characters. Certainly some of Cronenberg's movies don't have that effect, and I still consider them great. But the movie spends a lot of time with these three sets of characters and tries to mind pathos from them. That's why it's a problem. And I'd also say that Stanley Kubrick, like Darren Aronofsky, has been called a cold, detached, calculating director. And there's definitely truth in that. But whenever Kubrick was trying to get me emotionally engaged with characters and situations in his movies, he succeeded. And here is a movie where Aronofsky fails. And again, it is the only one. And again, you know, I'm not saying it fails for everyone. Uh, the Tarkovsky movie Solaris also has a futuristic space sci-fi twist on personal drama between a man and the woman he loves, and her survival is important to him. That one is a success. This one is a failure, again, to me. I would definitely, like, if you want a movie that'll really make you think and feel about, you know, a man and a woman, and you don't mind subtitles... One thing I definitely do really like about this is the idea expressed in the past story that the way to become immortal is in the ground. You will live forever through plants that your body turns into nutrients for. And I like that this horrible thing that happened to Tom Kistador is a very logical scientific understanding of the idea of immortality. He hates it, but if he had thought about what immortality might mean, he might have been able to predict that that's what it's going to be. You know, there's this idea that you know if we could achieve immortality then we'll never get sick uh if we get older we won't 
age badly, you know, all of these things. And just like, it's really not, it, it, you know, the, the, like today we already live much longer than we used to. And yeah, like there's a number of, you know, elderly people or really, really sick people who really don't particularly like that aspect, you know. Now, let's see. So yeah, uh, the movie is not critical of colonialism, rather romanticizes it, which is 100% the opposite of what we need media to do in 2006 and today. Now, before you comment that I misunderstand because the past story is critical of Christianity, I completely agree that it is critical. Crit it's Christianity critical. However, when it shows the Mayan people, they are made to look other. Can you honestly tell me that in those scenes you get the sense that they are human beings living their lives and just don't want people to come kill them, take their land, take their treasure? When we see Spain itself, it looks much more welcoming than the Americas. And before you say that it's being shown through a lens, it's, you know, Tom not accepting death, they could have shown that without making the Mayan people look other. The Mayan who recognizes Tom as first father comes across as like a zealot not good you know yeah like uh one of the religious zealots the the spaniards religious zealots not good pause the movie at that look at his teeth look at his face look you know look at his eyes look me in the eyes okay never tell me that if you saw someone look like that in the real world i i realize you can't actually look me in the well i guess you can look me in the eyes, but it's not because because camera and video replay. Anyway, tell me if you saw someone look like that in the real world, you wouldn't think they were dangerous. And before you say accuracy, the appearance of Tom and Izzy, the Spaniards, is not accurate to what people looked like in Spain back then. It's the way it is because it's what appeals to white straight audiences today. Requiem for a Dream is specifically very carefully filmed and edited to put us in the perspective of people doing something that is very harmful to them without losing our sympathy for them. The same could have been done for Tommy the Conquistador. Let's see. Maybe the Mayan with the flaming sword should prevent anyone from fighting Tom. Maybe he spots Tom before the battle starts, calls for the warriors to retreat. As it is, the movie takes some step in that direction. Once they get into a position to overwhelm Tom, they do simply carry him to the steps. Maybe instead of recognizing him as the first father, he simply doesn't attack people. Just keeping in mind, I'm no way trying to make excuses for colonizers for coming to the tree, but asks what they want with it and Tom's answer that he isn't looking to destroy or uproot the tree, which is arguably a lie, means that he is allowed in. As for how the movie would then show him failing until he eventually succeeds, instead of a fight with a sword-wielding Mayan, he should be on the way to the Mayan, but accidentally, because he's over-eager, die in a trap or something. As it is, there's almost definitely some viewers who watched the scene and thought it was awesome watching a white guy hacking down non-white, non-English speakers. Obviously, the movie isn't as bad in that regard as 300, which came out the same year, but still. Now, I, I understand the space stuff. I don't really have anything to say about it that folding ideas didn't. So, you know, just watch his video. The link will be in the description box. So I would definitely say that Aronofsky's head disappeared right up his own ass when making this. I appreciate that he pulled it out off after. And I personally don't think that it's gone up there since. I realize some people feel that it did with, with Mother. But yeah, I disagree. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that is, those are all of my notes. So, yeah, uh, hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite movie that is similar to this, including if it is this. Um, but yeah, you know, anything like sci-fi philosophical um, about, you know, about grief, about cancer, all, all these kinds of things. And I do definitely, you know, actually, yeah, I keep, I kept not putting it in my notes for some reason. I kind of like that, you know, Aronofsky was like, you know, all spacecraft today are like trucks in space. And he wanted to do something more like natural or something like that. He wanted to get away from the technological. Yeah, I appreciate that. I have not seen another movie where it's a bubble that they're traveling in when really like 
you know, he, he points out, I think maybe in the commentary track, you don't actually need, you know, we, we think of, you know, if, you, if you're going to fly, you got to have, like, you got to be aerodynamic, you know, but you don't, there's no friction in space, so you don't have to have aerodynamics to fly through space, you know, maybe to take off from from Earth, but past that, you know, so, so yeah, a, a bubble, there's, there's no reason why that wouldn't be a good, you know, I've, I don't know if I completely agree that trucks in space is absolutely everything for, for space travel, but again, he went somewhere different with it, and I like that. So, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists. They suggest a video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And one talking about my spoiler-filled thoughts on the most recent episode of Willow. And recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want my videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I will catch you next time.